Welcome everyone to today's webinar from Neural Magic. You had to achieve GPU class performance on everyday CPUs. My name is Brian House. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer uh, here at Neural Magic, and today is not May 5th. Today is June 23rd. I'll have to update that. I'm joined by my colleague Garvey. Want to introduce yourself? Hi, Garv Rao. I'm a head of product at Neural Magic. Excellent. So thank you all for joining us today. Let's see. Um, and let's get started. So a couple quick things for housekeeping. So um, all of our webinars are recorded and posted on our website. So that this recording will be up within about 48 hours. So we'll send you an email. So if, whether you have to run, you get interrupted, or you want to share it with a colleague, you're welcome to do that. We will also have Q&A, so you can ask questions at any time during the uh, session. In fact, I encourage you to try that right now. You can use the Q&A tab and tell us where you're joining from today. Beauty of webinars, and in this world we are in, experiencing today, people come in from all over the world. So uh, click the Q&A tab, send us, send us a note, tell us where you're joining. Um, Let's see. Oh, we have someone from India and in Lincoln, Nebraska, Richmond, Virginia. Excellent. All right. So like we said, it's I love webinars because they're global. It makes the world feel uh, small. We have somebody from Israel today. Excellent. <laughs> and someone who's just in Amsterdam for today. Um, Awesome. Well, I appreciate you, sh everyone sharing where you're calling in from and making sure you're all paying attention to. We will have multiple interactive session parts of today's webinar, so I encourage you to pay attention. Um, so with that, let's jump into our content. So as I said, we are going to talk about GPU class performance on everyday CPUs. So who's Neural Magic? Um, our company is founded out of MIT. It was actually founded by Professor Nir Shavit. Um, a longtime professor in CSAIL at MIT and co-author of the book, The Art of Multiprocessor Programming. A new edition is coming out in September. So if you have read this book, uh, many of our uh, folks we talked to have, and they um, give a plug for Nier and his new book. Um, and really our entire organization is really about high performance computing and applying our backgrounds in multi-core programming and machine learning and deep learning to this unique computational challenge. So we've got a great ton of experience in some of the leading companies in the world. We've got a great set of investors um, that are leading in early stage investment. We've raised 20 million to date. And right today we're 23 people, 17 of which are engineers. So we have a exceedingly technical staff focused on high performance computing and this unique computational challenge that is um, deep learning and make deep learning run really, really fast on everyday CPUs. So fundamentally, as we think about this, this challenge we face um, and the opportunities within the, the world of deep learning, really what we see is that we believe hardware is fundamentally constraining deep learning's potential. Um, as we all know, uh, machine learning and deep learning specifically has really exploded in recent years based on the uh, introduction and, and identification that people can use specialized hardware accelerators like GPUs to run these um, deep learning networks and models. And in doing so, we actually accept all sorts of constraints on what we can do and the types of questions we ask and the types of models we can run, really because the ability to do machine learning and deep learning specifically on CPUs is just limited, it's just too slow. Um, and so because it's too slow on CPUs and general purpose compute, we're willing to accept all these constraints. It's costly, it's costly to buy C GPUs, to rent GPUs, to get access to GPUs, to build data centers that support them, all the rest of it. In addition to that, it's exceedingly complex. Now all of your processes, your deployment pipelines, and CI CD processes now need to be hardware aware. You need to rewrite your um, many of your existing processes and build new ones just specifically for your deep learning models. And then finally, these accelerators are memory limited. They expose, impose uh, functional limitations on it. And so one of the things that drove our, the foundation of our company is our team was working 
in computational neurobiology using segmentation models to map brain pathways, neural pathways and synapses in the brain and all the structures in a project called Connectomics. Um, and in that, they experienced the memory limitations firsthand. They were processing more than two terabytes or a terabyte an hour's worth of uh, data coming off an electron microscope and running segmentation models on it. And to do that was just crazy. They didn't have GPUs, and if so, they'd have to deal with all the data pipeline issues. And so this is what prompted them to look at CPUs as an alternative. And lo and behold, they discovered a way to rethink the problem and uh, run this, with, take advantage of the memory advantage of a CPU and run these models much, much faster. So that's fundamentally at the heart of the three challenge, the, of what neural magic does. So we solve these three challenges, costly, complex, and limited. And so what we've built is an AI software runtime engine. Um, we refer to it as no hardware AI. And this software engine delivers GPU class performance without requiring GPUs or any specific acceleration, runs on everyday CPUs. Because it's software, it can fit into your modern CI, CD pipeline infrastructure. It's easy to scale out. We'll talk about it. it's easy to manage in Kubernetes, um, Dockers, and however you manage and deploy software. And because we don't have the memory limitations that you see with accelerators, we can use today bigger inputs um, to run inference on. We can have multiple models in a pipeline all in a shared memory. And in the future, as we build training um, on a CPU, we're actually introduce new model architectures and answer new questions that weren't um, possible before. Um, and so all of this leads to better predictions for you as part of your applications. So the question often becomes then is, how does all this work? And so there's a couple fundamental principles that came uh, and that, that emerged from uh, the work that Nir and Alex, our two co-founders, were doing along with their team at MIT and Harvard in this Connectomic projects. And they really have become the foundation of the technology we've built here at Neuromagic. So the first thing is really around sparse acceleration. And so when we look at a model, models require, as, as we all know, a tremendous amount of compute. And this combination of the uh, 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 significant compute required in terms of flops um, for deep learning models combined with the, the death of Moore's law has sort of convinced the market that we need to build bigger and bigger machines and more and more flops. Um, but really what, what the world is coming to realize is there's a sparse algorithm within every neural network. And so just throwing more and more flops at this doesn't necessarily mean you get better performance. And, and you have all, run into all sorts of limitations around how much power, how much, what's the size, how much bandwidth does it need to th just throw flops at the problem and brute force it. Um, and so what we've realized is that the required amount of compute can be reduced dramatically, but with both pruning and quantization. Pruning is available today, and we'll talk about that. Quantization is something we're building. And so what we've built is a product that gives you fine control over performance and accuracy with our uh, ML toolkit and our ML tooling. And then as part of that, we've developed a set of, of algorithms that accelerate uh, the execution of deep learning models. Um, those algorithms are in our inference engine and they, and they accelerate it specifically from uh, when running in sparse mode. So when it, they can run sparse models faster. And so this has been the big insight. There's lots of ways, reasons to, you might sparsify or prune a model to reduce the size, but people don't do that to get performance. They typically do that to reduce the size to deploy on embedded devices, small chips, what have you. What we do is we actually sparsify it, reduce the compute and allow you to get performance from that. So that's the first piece with regards to uh, how we get performance. The second piece is really around memory acceleration. So I talked for briefly about how um, throwing flops at the problem sort of a brute force approach to this. And so that's, they're certainly uh, uh, not required because there's sparse algorithms hidden in there, but also it's not enough. And the reason for that is these neural networks and deep learning models are both compute bound and memory bound. 
And so throwing flops of the problem may accelerate the compute bound components of the model, but they don't actually accelerate the memory bound pieces at all. And so as, as we look at different model architectures, we move from things like res nets to mobile nets or efficient nets um, or what have you, what you see is there's a component of the network that's compute bound and a component that's memory bound. And flops and compute don't accelerate the memory bound pieces. In fact, what we've seen in the market is, is new devices come out and they have more and more flops. They don't actually accelerate inference because they only can uh, act on a certain portion of the network. Um, and so the second piece of how we get performance is we've developed algorithms that minimize data movements, taking advantage of large CPU caches, and drive acceleration by accelerating the memory bound components of the, mar of the model. So it's not just addressing the compute piece, but also the memory bound piece of the, of the model as well. And this is how all available with our inference engine. And the combination of the two, the sparse acceleration and the memory acceleration is really what sets us apart. We see different components that are available in pieces, other places, but the combination of the two in concert is really where we are able to achieve GPU class performance. So that's at the heart of how neural magic works. So let's look at where you can use it. So today we have an inference engine it's available um, for use. We just announced it last week. Hopefully you saw the article uh, on MIT Tech Review. And our product is, is, is focused on computer vision as a market category. Um, and I set a couple of use cases within the computer vision market, specifically image classification and object detection. Um, we have segmentation in our near-term roadmap, so we're beginning to work on that. But really, being a startup and an early stage company, we're focused on computer vision um, initially. And our value proposition here is about reducing your costs of your uh, computer vision de application deployments, as well as providing an alternative where it, uh, employing a GPU or other accelerator doesn't make sense. Oftentimes, this is an edge deployments um, where putting it, uh, bringing in an attached GPU just is not a is not a great option. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the models that we can run, and we'll see these uh, some of this in our demo um, that we'll show that Garva lead later. Um, but this is the category where we can work today um, with our product as it exists. So let's click down a little bit more and sort of give you a sense of where our tools fit in your day-to-day uh, -day, um, deep learning deployment workflows. So. For the data scientists, we have a number of options that sit right in the deep learning frameworks that you utilize to build um, your model. So we have plugins for both PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, and we allow you to do tooling um, to prune your models today and uh, soon to quantize your models. So there's two primary pieces that sit within this ecosystem that are available for the data scientists. The first is the Neural Magic Model Repo, we have a set of pre-trained performance tuned models um, and for both TensorFlow and PyTorch that sits along your private model repo or maybe the TensorFlow Zoo or the other models that are available to you. And then the second thing is the, uh, the Neural Magic ML tooling. So this consists of a set of software called Neural Magic ML that allows you to prune models at various target accuracies. And we'll see a little bit of this in the demo later today. Um, as well as transfer learning tools that allow you to take the neural magic models and transfer learn them on your own data sets. And so you can run our models or any model in dense mode without any uh, pruning um, at all, um, or you can use the ML tooling kit to prune those models, get uh, better performance and reduce the amount of computation that's required. And so out of this process and, uh, is a representation of your model in the Onyx file format. And we take that Onyx file, we'll move it into a second um, into our deployment architecture. But before we do that, I have a quick poll for the audience. So first poll today is, what deep learning framework do you guys utilize? So let me just push it out there. So let's see if we can get a couple votes. See what people utilize today. We're always uh, checking to get a sense of where people spend their time um, historically 
what we've seen is, is TensorFlow has a strong uh, grip on uh, deployment architectures. We see a lot of PyTorch in, resource, in research. Um, but right now, with almost everybody voted, we have about 68% TensorFlow and 45% PyTorch, which is great. Um, very, very interesting. A little bit closer than we've seen uh, historically. So thank you so much. That's the first poll. I'll share the results. Uh, all right, and we'll move on. All right. All right, so then the next phase is, uh, so for the ML engineer, so the data scientist builds the, the, their model, they have targets for accuracy and performance, as you know, and then they deliver that model to the ML engineer for deployment. And so what we do is we deliver an Onyx model that then can be inputted into the Neural Magic inference engine. And so the engine provides a tremendous amount of flexibility for um, to map to how you're deploying your uh, deep learning models in production. So we can fit within a model serving solution you may have, whether it be the Onyx runtime server or TensorFlow serving, or maybe your own model serving solution. We ship with a model server out of the box. So if you need one, you can use the ours. It's just the Onyx runtime server. Um, all of this ships in a Docker container that can be managed via Kubernetes. You can uh, invoke the engine via REST API or via Python API. And once it's deployed in the Docker, you can install that anywhere on bare metal, on virtual machines, in the cloud, at the edge, um, or you know, in your data center. Really anywhere you can install uh, software and user space and you're using x86 um, infrastructure underneath it, you can deploy in, uh, in uh, the Neural Magic Inference Engine. So this is really designed to be plug and play, you slot in easily into your deployment architecture to uh, give you the performance that we're gonna show you as well as uh, simplify your overall deployment um, architecture. So let's, from there, let's dig in a little bit further into the three components that I mentioned, the repo, the toolkit, the tooling, and the inference engine. <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of what's in the model repo today, we're constantly adding models, um, but we have a series of both classification and detection models. Um, and for most models, we provide multiple versions of the model. So we have the dense version. So you can run it as is, just like the open source model. We have what we call the accurate version, which is 100% of baseline accuracy. So there's no loss in accuracy, but it's been pruned dramatically. Um, I think in the case of Bresner, it's, it's greater than 85% pruned. Um, and then we have what we call a performance version, a perf version, where we sacrifice one point in baseline accuracy um, to get even better performance. And so, you know, and then we have tooling, as we'll talk about in a second, that allows you to, to make those similar things when you prune your own models. Um, so we do this on both sides. We're building out our, our uh, um, set of object detection models. Um, today, today we're focused, they have been focused on SSDs to date. And the, really the goal of the model repo is to shorten your time to value and get you to deployment faster um, enables you to take pre-trained and pre-optimized models, but use them on your own data sense. But also they become a, a really good foundational component when you are doing pruning, because you can see best practices firsthand and compare to the work that you're doing with how these models are pruned um, as you sort of dig into that process to get better performance. All right, and this brings us to our second poll, which is what types of models are people using? So let me launch this, you see a much longer list of models um, that maps to our model repo. So uh, love if you could to uh, give us some, some uh, insights in the type of models you're using. All right, lots of SSDs today. And no surprise, lots of ResNets as well. Interesting. Um, this is a good mix across the board here. So we've got about almost half of you have voted. Um, this is the second of three polls, just so you know. So uh, we'll be qu quickly, we'll be done with the interactive portion. It looks like we've come to um, 
uh, some stasis here. So I'll share the results really quickly. The winner is, not surprisingly, ResNet 50, but you can see that across the board and we see a, a number of uh, SSDs and efficient nets, which is interesting. So the next piece um, that I want to cover quickly um, and leave time for for the demo is the ML toolkit and our ML tooling. And so this is a set of capabilities currently in a Jupyter notebook, which Gar is going to walk through to help you simplify the process of pruning and sparsifying a model. So easy to use GUI, also have give you command line tools with hands-on controls to define what's your training epochs, where do you want to set sparsity, to what degree do you set sparsity, we're building a set of resources around to teach you how to do that in uh, um, uh, how to do that quickly in here within our tool set and all this saves to YAML. So I will leave that to um, to uh, to Garov uh, and he'll walk in that in much further depth. Do you have one question here from uh, uh, Alexander? It looks like he says I'm working on NLP. So uh, it's a good question. So NLP is something we're beginning to investigate. We think we're very bullish on our technology for NLP. Um, so, uh, so there's definitely uh, something in our, our medium term roadmap, but I did want to uh, cover that. You're, you're not uh, forgotten. We'd love to learn more about what type of NLP you do. We're very bullish on things like BERT and uh, transformers. All right, so our third poll is we talked about various optimizations. So the question is, is what optimization, things like sparse structured pruning, unstructured pruning, quantization, are people doing today on your models? Um, so this is always an interesting one. Um, and one of the things we see historically, we just did a poll or a survey with about 300 respondents and we said about 60, over 60% 60 of people hadn't done any optimizations on their models, um, which I, we thought was very interesting. Um, so uh, I think we're at the beginning of the market maturity for things like techniques like pruning and quantization. All right, and this aligns a little bit with there. All right, we're at 62%, so I'm gonna end and share the results. So this is probably the highest we've seen on pruning and quantization as a percentage of the audience um, in any of the polls and surveys we've done. So kudos to all of you. Excellent. So last component um, I wanted to talk about today is the inference engine. So um, today, as I said, our, our engine is compatible with Intel x86 CPUs. We're looking at other x86 CPUs from AMD and others. We uh, use uh, any CPU that has both AVX2 or AVX512 instructions we can run on. We take advantage of that instruction set to implement our algorithms. And so one of the things you'll see in the demo is we compile uh, an executable in the inference engine based on a couple of uh, inputs, model file, the CPU instruction set, the batch size, and the number of cores selected. And then from this, we generate the runtime that can just then start feeding and responding to predictions. And as I mentioned, all of this is invoked either via uh, Python API, right in the binary and part of your application, or can be called as a web service via REST API. Um, so Easy to deploy, sits at the same level as you'd put with any other runtime library. Um, and so it's easy to slot in just a few lines of code and you'll be up and running with the Neural Magic Inference Engine uh, once, you, once you have all the pieces in place. So with that, let's talk a little bit about some, um, some, some results and some comparisons we have, and then we'll shift over to Garv and, and get into the demo. Um, so when we think about performance and performance comparisons, we sort of think it on two matrices. So the first is pure performance. And so what you see here is, is raw performance is images per second. This is on a classification model, ResNet 50, very familiar to this audience. And what we're comparing here is Neural Magic deployed on a four core CPU, Neural Magic deployed and taking advantage of an 18 core CPU, all the cores. And we're comparing that against the T4 
in the, the inference chip from NVIDIA and V100 from NVIDIA. And so what you can see is um, this is batch size one and FP32. The 18 core does up to two X better than, uh, than these options. Uh, but even a four core is almost uh, as fast in batch size one as a V100, uh, which is great because what the, the second way we look at performance is to look at price performance. And so when we say, if we measure the number of items per dollar, because we know how much these all cost, we just use AWS uh, hourly on-demand pricing to build this comparison, is the, the value of the four core becomes critical, right? So um, for if you as a deep uh, data science team are looking to deploy applications, reduce your cost of deployment and figure out what the most effective effective performant infrastructure is, suddenly now going down to a four core CPU as compared to a T4 or V100 is becomes a really, really clear choice, much, much, much better value. And this is all in an environment on ResNet 50 where it's ideally designed for a GPU. It's a computationally dense model, requires has a lot of flops, requires a lot of compute. So whether it's batch size one or larger batch sizes does this, but this you know, the, the ability, the price difference, and then the ability for us to take advantage of even small core sets on CPUs um, really makes our value proposition very compelling. Let's look at another model. So this is MobileNet V2. Um, so raw performance, this is a much more structurally sparse model. You'll see we do great on batch size one as compared to the two options for um, on, on GPUs, and then not surprisingly, that performance you know, is multiplied when we think about it from price performance. It's up to 40X better. And this is on batch size one, all of which we'd expect, right? So a common thing we get is, of course, you know, batch size one CPU is gonna do better. What if we do larger batch sizes? Well, if I look at larger batch size for mobile net at batch size 64, now my 18 core CPU and my V100 are about the same even though the 18 core CPU is half the price of the V100. And it's still um, almost three X better than a T4 for inference, right? And then if I look at price performance, the pattern holds true. Four core and the 18 core, given they're so much cheaper, um, I just provide much, much better price performance as compared to the expensive accelerator. So um, just wanted to give you a flavor of what we're seeing in practice. Um, you know, we'd love to, to work with you and see what your own benchmarking looks like and see how uh, we might be able to, uh, to help you achieve both the performance and the price performance that we see. Um, my, now at this point, what I'm going to do is stop sharing and let Gaurav come over and do a demo. Over to you, Gaurav. All right. Thank you, Brian. Let me get my screen up and running. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay, perfect. So, you know, just as an extension to um, two specific slides that Brian showed, you know, earlier in the deck, there was a slide that showed a data science view of taking a neural network and generating an onyx that would then feed into our engine. And sort of that, that was the view of the data scientist. And then the second slide was that of the, we call it ML engineer, who's responsible for deploying that model at scale, generating the inferences and sort of aligning it to an actual pipeline. Similarly, what you're gonna see is two separate demos. One is gonna show you how we generate an onyx. And in the, this specific demo, we're gonna talk you through how we have pruned a PyTorch model. Uh, generate an onyx. And then the next demo that I'm going to show you is once I've generated that onyx, how do I actually generate an inference, check the accuracy of that prediction, and then more importantly, show you how we're benchmarking um, within our engine. And so you're actually going to see some live performance um, in conjunction with the slides that Brian showed you. So I'll start here um, with just a little bit of background. And you know, I think there was actually a question in the chat about this. I won't repeat too much of what Brian went into, but the concept of pruning in general or compression in general is really about removing weighted connections in a network. 
And you know, what we've seen is, especially in neural networks, specifically in computer vision, like classification networks, those that are computationally dense are typically over-parameterized. And what that means is <clears throat> we actually see a number of unused parameters that can theoretically be removed and won't impact your, your validation or your validation loss. So what you're gonna actually see us do here is do two things. And hopefully this helps answer the question in the chat. We at Neural Magic are, are pruning by utilizing unstructured pruning. So what does that mean? We're actually setting weights in the neural network to zero and introducing a multiplication by zero within the network, which means when I actually come to the runtime, when I'm actually generating a prediction, assuming my inference engine is smart enough to ignore sort of these no operations, I can get significant speed up through my prune network. Um, so hopefully that gave a little bit of an example in terms of you know, what we're doing and how we're incorporating pruning. And then the last background piece of information I'll give here and then actually go through this is you know, we've seen research show that the gradual magnitude pruning technique is actually the most effective. And you're gonna see that in the actual demo where we're gonna take a train network and we're actually gonna iteratively prune over a number of epochs, starting with a, a more um, gradual prune to start. And then we start ramping up the pruning towards you know, higher epochs. So and you're gonna see that live as we, we walk through this demo. So that was just more background. And this is just a Jupyter notebook that walks through um, a PyTorch pruning CNN um, using the uh, Atom Optimizer specifically. The first thing you're gonna see is setting up the environment. And you know, Brian kind of showed you in the slide that we have an ML toolkit. The ML toolkit is designed to run locally. We want you to be able to prune and effectively recalibrate that model where your data is. And we understand that data privacy can be an issue. Um, so we want to allow you to be able to prune where your data is located. Um, in this example, I've actually run our ML toolkit uh, and pip installed it on my MacBook Air. Um, so certain things I'm going to run, certain things that may take a little bit of time. And as the notebook mentioned, to actually successfully retrain and recalibrate the network, It'll take about 45 minutes running on a CPU. So I'm gonna go ahead and click and run and basically get my PyTorch CNN model um, set up. So that should take just a second here. And then what you're gonna see the moment we get the environment set up, it's telling me just watch out for TensorFlow. Um, and I should add, by the way, that while I'm showing you a PyTorch pruning demo, we also have the same set of libraries and scripts for TensorFlow as well. So these become framework um, dependent somewhat, right? So if you're pruning and training in, in PyTorch, we have the associated libraries. If you're training and pruning in TensorFlow, we have the associated libraries. So the next step within the, the demo here is I'm actually going to set up my model and data set. And we picked a very simplistic CNN to start. And you'll see very soon um, as we set up the data set um, what the training data set looks like, which happens to be an MNIST data set, as well as the training and the validation data set. So very quickly, the model has been loaded. It's a simple five layer uh, neural network. It's got four convolutional layers and then we have a classifier at the end. Uh, and then you can see at the bottom, you know, we've loaded the MNIST data set. So it's a, it has 60,000 data points from a training data set standpoint. And from a validation data set standpoint, it has about 10,000 data points. And the reason why we, we like to show this is you'll see the code snippet here where if you wanted to run this with your own network, with your own data set, we have the APIs, the PyTorch pruning APIs that you can just run. Um, so this is not meant to show you the only data set or the only models you can run with, just more of a general example of how we do this. So the next step, once now that we've loaded the model and we've loaded the data set, 
is we actually want to run a loss sensitivity. And the reason why this is important is, you know, Brian mentioned earlier in the deck, it's not so much about compression and sparsification, it's also being able to recover and maintain accuracy. And in order to understand the trade-offs, we do a, a sensitivity analysis to say, which layers within the network are more sensitive? And typically, the more parameters from the input data that you're running, the less sensitive the, the layer is. And the less sensitive typically means it can be more prunable. Um, and you're going to see very quickly how we decompose that loss sensitivity by using a one-shot loss sensitivity analysis. So I'm going to do this for the five-layer network we have. Uh, it takes roughly a few seconds. And it's good. And again, remember, this is all running on my, my CPU locally right now. So there's no GPU involved. And then as that's running, what you're going to see pop up is a view, right, of the various sensitivities within the layers. And what that's going to tell us is, how do I want to set my hyperparameters for pruning? Based on the sensitivity analysis of each layer, do I want to prune? And if I want to prune, to what percentage? Do I want to leave alone because of certain sensitivities and a worry that we may not be able to recover accuracy? All of that is going to be displayed momentarily. And you know, this is sort of our first iteration of a, um, I'll call it a pruning UI UX. What we also see going forward is tooling to make the entire estimation and estimation process much, much simpler so that you can load a network and immediately have more visibility into the type of performance trade-offs as well as accuracy recovery and loss sensitivity trade-off. Okay, and I timed that perfectly. So the loss sensitivity just came back. And as I, as I told you, we have five layers within this uh, CNN. And what you're seeing here is, you know, sort of layers zero and one are highly sensitive. Um, whereas layers two, three, and four are less sensitive. So when it comes time to actually setting my hyperparameters, right, and determining what layers I want to prune, you're going to see very quickly our estimator has created a simple table. And it's telling me right away based on the sensitivity of that first layer that I should actually not sparsify it. So that's why in the orange, you're seeing high loss sensitivity is being displayed. We're actually choosing the recommendation from our estimators, do not prune that layer. Now, the second layer uh, had less loss sensitivity, and we're going to start with a conservative pruning run of 80% sparsity. So that means 80% of the weights are being set to zero within this layer. And then you can see furthermore, the last three layers which we saw were less sensitive, we are pruning to 90%, right? So we are effectively setting 90% of the weights in those bottom three layers because they were less sensitive to a 90% um, pruning state. Now, this is again, just to give you a sense of how we do the pruning, how we estimate and do the trade-off for both performance and accuracy recoverability. What I'm not going to run immediately right now is the recalibration step, because this then goes through the retraining on my CPU, which can take a little bit of time. But what I want to call out here is the code. Um, you can see very quickly, especially here, you know, when you're running locally, we allow you to choose specifically the device that you are going to either recalibrate or retrain on, right? So you can choose to either run it to retrain on a CPU or you can retrain on a GPU, effectively analogous to the training process you may have in place. And then more importantly, we have the code um, for you to just plug the pruning APIs directly back into your library of choice, right? So in this case, this is my PyTorch library. So I have all of the necessary tooling and scripts to plug this PyTorch pruning API code right back into my PyTorch tr uh, training flow. 
And then what you would see here is again, effectively go through a retraining process. And then the very, very last step is once I've retrained that model, I'm gonna export to Onyx. And you know what I wanted to do is, now assuming I have an exported Onyx, jump into a view of how do I generate an inference and let's run a benchmark together. So I've jumped into a new notebook and the notebook is gonna run an image classification demo. And I'm gonna take and start with an Onyx file, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do as I look to run this benchmark is determine the infrastructure I'm running on. And this notebook is actually being hosted on a four core AWS instance or a C5 to Excel. So knowing that there's four um, physical cores, I, I, it's detected that I have four CPUs available to test on. I'm then gonna choose a model. And you know, one of the questions in the, in the chat earlier was, you know, are you gonna show, are these numbers dense or are they um, sparse? So we just kind of walk through what it would take to sparsify a network. So I'm gonna show you sort of a sparse benchmark. So I'm taking ResNet 50 since that was a popular model. And you're gonna see the first thing it's doing is it's loading that Onyx file. So think about the output we just created in the previous notebook. I've generated Onyx. And as Brian mentioned earlier, to actually call and invoke the Python API around our inferencing engine, the only parameters that I effectively need to generate an inference are these three parameters right here. Give me the file path of the Onyx, tell me the batch size and tell me the number of cores. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up the model. And very quickly, you'll see that I have, you know, I have my model file path. I've got my batch size one. I am running on four cores and I've detected I have an AVX 512 instruction set. Now I'm gonna prepare the model for inference to actually check the accuracy of the classifier. So we just typically take a ImageNet data set and I'm gonna randomize the images that are gonna get chosen. Not a snake fan, so let's hopefully, yep, there's a couple of snakes. They always get picked in here. So there's a couple of random images. And the next thing we're gonna do is actually generate an inference with our inferencing engine and check the validity of the classifiers and the predictions that are coming back. So I'm gonna go ahead and click and run this cell and you can quickly see the, the predictors are, and classes are coming back. So I've predicted bird, I've predicted snake, I've predicted loggerhead, um, and I've picked stingray, snake, and wombat. So in general, you know, the accuracy of the prediction is holding true. Now, the, you know, to come back to the benchmark, so, you know, we've taken the Onyx from a potential Onyx export. In the case before, it was through a pruning exercise, but I've taken my Onyx, I've loaded it, I have determined the number of cores I'm running on, and now I'm gonna show you sort of the, the actual performance we're getting on this four core uh, AWS instance. So again, I'm gonna select cores to tell the inferencing engine exactly what to run. And then I'm gonna select batch size so I'll select, uh, you know, batch size one and batch size 64 so that you get a sense of both latency and throughput sensitivity. And then I'm gonna go ahead and execute my benchmark. And before I do that, I'll show you some of the benchmarking code. So again, to actually create the model, it's very simple. It's uh, Onyx file, batch size, number of cores. And in this case, we do a set of warm-up and then test iterations. So for this, we do 10 warm-up iterations, which you see here, and then we do 10 test iterations. So I'm gonna go ahead and run my benchmarking. So that has been set. And then we're gonna actually go ahead and execute the benchmark. And that should be running in the background here momentarily. The Latency and batch size one come relatively quickly. Uh, and then the batch size 64 takes a little bit longer because we're processing more images. And then rather than trying to figure out what the actual performance is, we have a, a graph that displays at the end. Now, just as this is running, you know, to again, answer the question in the chat, 
had we gone through, for example, a mobile net example or a mobile net demo that uh, from the chart that Brian had showed, we would simply just take the model export and then generate the benchmark prediction, right? So we wouldn't have to go through any of the pruning example that I showed you before. That model is typically structurally sparse to begin with and has a number of one by one depth wise convolutions. And as a result of that, it has fewer parameters and they're already structurally sparse. So we don't have to apply any of the pruning techniques I mentioned. Um, so in this case, just to remind you, we're running the ResNet 50. So I'm going to go ahead and display sort of the results. And you can very quickly see sort of the summary of the ResNet 50 uh, benchmark. And keep in mind, this is a pruned ResNet 50. Um, so we sparsified this ResNet to 87.5% uh, and maintained ba uh, baseline accuracy within one point. So for four cores, bat size 64, I'm seeing about 158 images per second or a latency of about 402 milliseconds. On the four core for batch size one, I'm seeing about 90 images per second or latency of about 10.99 um, milliseconds per item. So that was sort of the end of the benchmark. Uh, and hopefully that gives you a little bit of visibility in the pruning technique, how we generate a Onyx export and then more importantly, once we have an Onyx export, how we can run it and invoke the engine to generate a prediction and also give you a little bit of visibility into how we are uh, benchmarking and generating our benchmarks. All right, Brian, back to you. All right, thanks, Carl. Let me get my, pull my slides back up. So thank you for the uh, was an excellent demo. Appreciate that. Let's see. Yeah, I need to go back over to PowerPoint. All right, can you see my uh, slides? Looks good. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, so great. So this concludes the uh, content portion of our presentation. So what you saw today is how Neural Magic is delivering deep learning performance with all the flexibility of the software solution. No specialized hardware accelerators required. Or even ran it on his laptop. Um, and so really the, you know, the key takeaways that I encourage you to think about um, is, is this is really about reducing the costs for your deep learning deployments. It's about taking advantage of abundant CPUs you have, whether they be in your data center, underneath desks, or um, in, uh, in your reserve fleet on uh, one of the public cloud, the hyperscale clouds. Um, and it's in, with our software, you can accelerate real-time results for your computer vision apps, as well as eliminate the need for an attached specialized hardware accelerator. You know, if you have constraints around size, power, weight, what have you, this enables you to take and employ, deploy a whole new sets of models um, that work within constraints that you might have. Um, and because it's software, it fits seamlessly into your existing software deployment pipeline. So really makes it much easier to get uh, deep learning models out into production. You know, we understand this is a challenge for everyone. And so it's how do we simplify and accelerate that process is key. So with that, I am going to um, uh, open it up for questions. We've got a number of questions in here. Um, so we'll keep doing that. While you guys are thinking about your questions, please don't be shy. I encourage you to check out our resources page on our website. This is where all of our upcoming as well as recorded webinars. All of our content is available there. One thing I will note is um, we've just put together a uh, best practices guide for pruning that we're gonna turn into a multi-part blog series um, with a bunch of assets. So that is coming very shortly. So um, you should start to see that over the next few weeks. Um, also, we've seen a couple people ask questions around product access. Um, and how to get some of the, the notebooks and tools that uh, Garv walked us through. So uh, you can go right to this link. We're um, in request access. Um, we're not, we don't have a free download yet at this point. We're still early in our product journey. Um, we expect to have that um, in, in short order, but I uh, would love to fill out that form. We'd love to set up a call and we'd love to learn a little bit what, what you're doing with deep learning and talk about potential fit and get you signed up in our technical evaluation program. 
Um, so, all right, where'd all the questions go? Um, so one of the questions says, uh, you touched upon quantization in the beginning of your talk. Does your product support that now? And what is the performance? So we're actually um, in the process of building quantization as we speak. So Intel introduced uh, in the most recent generation of chips, Cascade Lake generation, support for FP16 and Int8. So we're building that in our product. We expect to have um, that later this year. Um, and so what we expect is somewhere between three and four X uh, increase in performance on top of our FP32 performance when we offer uh, quantized models. Um, quant and so we'll be able to run them sparse and sparse quantized as well. So we're excited for that. Um, Brian, you want to touch on the, I think Simon asked a really good question on transfer learning from um, our pre or basically transfer learning from a prune model. You want to yeah, go for talk it. a little bit about it? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. Sure. Um, so I just, you know, I, just to reiterate, I think Simon, your, your question and the ask, you know, if you look, if you remember the slide Brian showed earlier in the deck, there were sort of two paths, either start with a customer private model and customer private data set or start with the neural magic model repo, right? And in that model repo, we have both dense uh, models as well as performance tuned models that have been pre-trained and in some cases sparsified, right? You know, so for example, the ResNet 50 model um, I showed you in the Jupyter Notebook demo is a model that we have readily available. And we also have, you know, as an example, a sparsified SSD. Um, and those, you know, you can basically, and we encourage you to take those models, start with those models, uh, and transfer learn from uh, your private data set to get a better sense of how well they would perform in your environment. Awesome, thanks, Gar. Uh, Josh asked a question around how does pricing work for our software? So, um, so we are currently have a subscription pricing model. We have two, uh, a couple different options. We have a developer subscription, which gives you access to all the tools, the model repo and has unlimited use for non-production uh, environments. And then we have a production model that's really based on compute capacity and is tied to the number of cores. So you deploy on N servers with Y cores, we do calculate and that's what we're, uh, our price we pay on a per core basis. It works out to a few pennies per hour per core. Um, and obviously the more cores you buy, the better uh, the price you get. And those are annual subscriptions. So you get uh, over that time, you get access to uh, additional uh, capabilities, new model support, new operators, um, bug fixes, all the rest. Question, uh, this was, um, oh, question disappears. So Samuel asked, main message here is about trade-offs. Does this mean G performance doesn't have any uh, trade-offs? So, so the, this is really where we started the presentation before, right? So GPUs, um, as we all know, have introduced a sort of open, the sort of Cambrian explosion, if you will, of deep learning. Um, and that's great, but we impose a bunch of uh, constraints as we talked about cost, complexity, and memory limitations. And so, you know, really what, what the solution we do is, is we eliminate those trade-offs and limitations um, in order to give you more flexibility and do it with a pure software solution without having to, to go into specialized environments. There are certainly instances where GPUs, and you saw it even in some of the slides, have equivalent or maybe even better performance. But then when you start to look at it from a flexibility, price, performance, and efficiency point of view, um, you know, really with our solution running on an everyday CPU, really the, the performance is outstanding. Um, and so that, that, that's really the piece. We don't have any of the memory limitations. We don't have all the hardware uh, deployment, CIC deployment issues, and certainly cost is, is not an issue or certainly a, a much uh, dramatically lesser um, when running on a CPU. We have an action detection model. Can it be optimized for CPU inference? This is from Vivek. Yes, so it's a great question. So um, I think the way for us that we think about this is a, is a couplefold. So, um, so obviously 
you know, models, I think of them as Lego sets. So model like MobileNet is the, uh, I have a, my son loves the Star Wars Lego set. So that's like the Millennium Falcon. And that consists of lots of little Lego pieces. And those are the, in the deep learning world are the operators or primitives that, that may, make up that model. Um, and so for a particular model, whether it's action detection or something else, what we look at is what do we support the operators, things like convolutions, ReLUs, pooling, you know, all the different operations that are in that make up the model that does what it does. Um, and then if so, then do we support the model architecture? And so those are the two dimensions we think about it. So we'd love to have a conversation with Vivek. If it's detection, today we support SSD, um, single shot detections. If, it's, if it looks like that, then, um, then we will support it. Um, we're working on things that have dynamic uh, batches and um, dynamic sh uh, uh, shapes. So those are um, on our roadmap uh, in the forward, but we'd love to have a conversation about that. Let's see, any other questions, Garb, that stand out for you? I'm trying to see which ones I just answered recently. <laughs> um, yeah. I think uh, I think the, the sparsity is, is an interesting question um, from earlier. So, you know, what ratios do we require? So typically we would expect sparsification of at least 50% to generate performance improvement within um, the neural magic uh, inference engine. Uh, and as just a general rule of thumb, and I probably went through it quickly in the demo, you know, we often guide our users to start with a more conservative run or runs before getting into uh, more, uh, you know, performance tuned runs like in the 90s, uh, 90 percentile. So, you know, we would typically start and suggest with an 80% sparsity run um, and then gradually move that up. And this sort of applies to the type of pruning we're doing, which I mentioned earlier, right? Where we kind of do this over a number of epochs.